بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ویلکم ٹو دا لیکچر تھری آف دا کورس انٹروڈکشن ٹو کمپیوٹنگ آئی ہوپ دا پریویس لیکچر ہیو بین ویل کلیئر ٹو یو اینڈ یو ہیو نو فردر کوشچنز اباؤٹ ایٹ آئی ایم آلویز ٹرائنگ ٹو میک دا کانسیپٹس ایز کلیئر ایز پاسبل آئی ول اسٹرانگلی ریکمینڈ ٹو ریڈ دا بک ریگولرلی and visit the accompanying website I have given you in the first lecture because that website will give you additional web information and websites where you can have more information about this course. For each chapter, additional websites have been given on the accompanying website. By browsing and visiting those websites, the concepts shall be more clear to you. We will begin the today's lecture with the summary of the last lecture. In the last lecture, we discussed the developments in the microcomputers from 1984 to 2008. During this time, we discussed the developments made by Intel, AMD, Motorola in the field of hardware, especially the computer processors. Then IBM, Apple, Microsoft, they make significant contributions in the hardware and software and the advent of the internet. Then we discuss about the computer for individual use. In this context, we first of all discuss that computers can be categorized by number of people who can use them simultaneously by their power or by other criteria. So for individual use, we have discussed the six different types of computers, namely the desktop computers, or we call them personal computers, in short, PCs. Uh, the term uh, personal computers can be used when referring to any computer meant for use by a single person. Then we discuss about the workstations. The workstation is a specialized single user computer but typically has more power and features than compared to a standard desktop PC. Then we discuss about a notebook computer, which, uh, which are fully featured PCs, but can easily be carried around and give a lot of mobility to the end users. Then we talk about the tablet computers, which is another type of portable personal computer but it can accept handwritten input when the user touches the screen with, the, with a digitized pen. Then we discuss about the handheld computers, which are computing d devices that fits in your hands, and the personal digital assistants, in short, we call it PDAs, is an example of a handheld computer. We also discuss about the smartphones, which are the digital cellular phones that have features found in professional personal computers such as web browsers, email capability and more. Nowadays, Blackberries, iPhone, Nokia E72, Nokia C6, Samsung Galaxy Note, they are all are categorized as smartphones. Then we discuss the computers for organizations. In this context, we say that some type of computers such as the network servers, mainframes, miniframes, and supercomputers, they are commonly used by organizations where more than one people are using them, and they support the computing needs of many users. A network server is a powerful personal computer that is used as the central computer in an organization's network. Mainframes. They are the powerful special purpose computers that can support the needs of hundreds of th or thousands of users. The mini computer supports dozens or hundreds of users at a time. And the supercomputers are the largest and most powerful computers. Then we discuss the role of computers in our society. In this context, we should this first of all many families at home they have at least one computer 
and an internet connection in their home and they use their personal computers for tasks such as communication, work, schoolwork and personal finances. And uh, in the education field, the computer technology is playing an ever-growing role in the schools where students are being taught computer skills at younger ages and asked to incorporate computers into their daily work assignments. In some schools, computers have been included in the curricula from the middle school to the high school and even in the colleges and they have made it mandatory for the students to learn the computer skills. In the small businesses, computers enable them to operate more efficiently by allowing workers to do a wide variety of tasks. In the industry of all kinds, computers play vital roles in everything from personal management to product design and manufacturing and then on goes on to shipping. In the government sector, it not uh, only use a great deal of computer technology, but also com contribute to its development. Computers are involved in every aspect of the healthcare field, from managing schedules and handling billings to making patient diagnoses and perform complex surgery. That was the, what we have discussed in our lecture number two. So let's start with the lecture three. Today we'll start by looking inside the computer system. Most people believe that computers must be extremely complicated devices because they perform such amazing tasks. To some extent, this is true. As you learn later in the course, the closer you look at a computer system, you find that the computers are more complex. But like any machine, a computer is a collection of parts, which are categorized according to the kinds of work they do. Although there are many variations on the parts themselves, there are only a few major categories. You learn about those families of computer components and their basic functions. You will have mastered some of the important concepts in the computing, but as you will see that the concepts are very simple and very easy to understand. The today's lecture will give you a glimpse inside a standard desktop computer and introduces you to some of its uh, important components or the parts. We will also see that how these components will work together and allow you to interact with the system. You will also discover the importance of the software without which a computer cannot function. Finally, you will see that a user is very important for the, pro for the working of the system. Without people, a computer system cannot work. Although there are some userless computers, but there are few and they are meant for very specialized tasks. Every computer system have four parts, namely hardware, software, data, and the users, which are people which interact with the computer. In the diagram, this computer monitor, CPU, keyboard, printer, they are all hardware. And the data is the information which is displayed or put inside the system. And the people or the user interact with the system. And the software basically are the programs which are installed on the computer system. And basically these are the, this is the problem solver. And these programs help the user to solve their problem and make them easy to use. Let's talk about hardware. Hardware are the mechanical devices in the computer. We can simply say the hardware is any part of the computer that you can touch, whether it's a keyboard, a printer, or a PDA. If you can touch it, it is hardware. 
The hardware consists of interconnected electronic devices that you can use to control the computer's operation, such as input and output. The generic term device refers to any piece of hardware. Now terms software. Basically, software are the set of instructions that makes the computer perform its tasks. It tells the computer what to do. In other words, software tells the, uh, the computer what to do and how to do it. The term program refers to any piece of software. There are thousands of programs exist nowadays. Some of them are for computers own use and others they are for the service of the user. The programs which are for computers own use, it performs tasks and manage its the computer's resources. And the software which are for the service of the user will enable him or her to perform tasks such as creating documents. Thousands of different software programs are available to be used on the personal computers. Majority of people who purchase computers do so because of software. They want to email or type letter or chat with the friends or, or make their uh, things more easy. Nearly every reason given to purchase a computer is based on the software needs. The third element of the computer system is data. Data consists of individual facts or pieces of information that are themselves may not make much sense to a person. Data is a plural of the word datum and datum means raw fact. A computer primary job is to process these raw facts and convert them into useful information. So information is the processed data. It is useful. Data itself is not useful. When it is processed, it becomes useful and that usefulness we call information. For example, if you saw the average highway mileage of six different cars, all the different pieces of data might not mean much to you. However, if someone created a chart from the data that visually compared and ranked the vehicle mileages, you will probably easily understood. In the figure here, if only this information is given, it is not useful. But with the help of the chart, it is very easy to comprehend and interpret the information given in the chart. The computers basically, they organize and present data for the beneficial of the users. The fourth part of the computer system are the users. Basically, these are the people who operate the computer. They are also called users. It can be argued that some computer systems are complete without a personal involvement. However, no computer is totally autonomous. Even if a computer can do its job without a, a person sitting in front of it, people still design, build, and program and repair these computer systems. This lack of autonomy is especially true of personal computer systems which are the focus of this course and are designed specifically for use by the people. So even for the userless computers, people are still needed to design them, to build them, to repair them, and to maintain them. Now let's see the information processing cycle. If you remember that in the first lecture, I've told you the human and computer processing model. They work on the same processing model. Some input will be given, which will be processed, and an output will be produced. In the computer, this input is basically the data, which is, pro which is processed, or some computation is performed on this data, and 
information is being output for reference and use. <coughs> a computer might perform a mathematical operation on two numbers, then it will display the result. Or the computer might perform a logical operation, such as comparing two numbers, and then display the result. These operations are part of a process called information, information processing cycle, which is a set of steps the computer follows to receive data, process the data according to the instructions given in the program, display the results information to the user, and store the results accordingly. The following steps are used to process the data. First of all, the data will be input in the computer. Then it will be processed by the processor. And the output will be generated, maybe on the monitor, on a printer, or some other storage device. And finally, the result may be stored permanently on the storage devices. We will now see the each step one by one. The input. In input, the computer accept, accepts data from some source. During this part of the cycle, the computer accepts data from some source, such as the user or a program for some processing. In, during the part of processing, the computer's processing components perform actions on the data based on the instructions given by the user or the program. For example, you may have to calculate the results of the students, you have to assign them grades, you have to calculate the cumulative uh, grade point averages, and to give the percentage, deviance, and all that. In the output, the computer conveys the result to the user. The output can be in the form of text, in the form of numbers, graphic, it can be an image, it can be a video, or it can be a sound. And in some cases, this output is optional. It may be stored in the form of a file. The fourth step in processing the data is the storage. This is also optional. In this step, the computer permanently stores the results of its processing on a disk, tape, or some other kind of storage medium. As with output, storage is optional and may not always be required by the user or program. Now let's look at the essential computer hardware. The desktop PCs computers, they use the same basic hardware. And the hardware are categorized into four types. The processor, the memory, the input and output, and the storage. We will now discuss the, these computer hardware one by one. First of all, let's see the processing devices. Processing is the procedure that transforms raw data into useful information. To perform this transformation, the computer uses two components, the processor and the memory. In the figure here, you will see various kind of processors developed by different companies. In our last lecture, I have discussed about the evolution of computers. So in that, they started, Intel started with 4004, then it's 286, 386, 486, Pentium, Core to Duo processor, Core Quad processors, nowadays i3, i5, and i7 processors are available in the market. Let's talk about the processor the first of all. The processor is like the brain of the computer. It organizes and carries out instructions that come from either the user or from the software. In the uh, personal computer, the processor usually consists of one or more specialized chips called microprocessors which are silvers of silicon or other material, each with many tiny electronic circuits. Basically, we can say that a processor chip 
is a tiny piece of silicon that contains millions of miniature electronic circuits. In the figure you can see a Pentium 3 processor chip. To process data or complete an instruction from a user or a software, the computer passes electricity through the circuits to perform the function. So let's see how this how does this everything is connected? In the power, in the, in, the, in the desktop PC, this is all connected through a thing called motherboard. The RAM, the, the memory, the input devices, the output devices, the processor, all are connected together on this motherboard. Motherboard is the main printed circuit board in the computer. Everything connects to the motherboard. As you can see in the figure, this is the processor, these are the memory banks, and these are the expansion slots for adding different cards into the system. And here you can see the uh, peripherals attachments. The expansion slots plugs on the motherboard for expanding the personal computer's capability via additional circuit boards. The network interface cards, the video cards, the sound cards, modem, everything is connected with the computer through these expansion slots. In many newer computers, these devices are built directly into the motherboard. Some newer microprocessors are large and complex enough to require their own dedicated circuit boards which plug into a special slot in the motherboard. You can think of the motherboard as the master circuit board in the computer. Now let's talk a little bit of detail about the processor. A pro PC processor is usually a single chip or a set of chips contained on a circuit board. It carries out the instructions from the program. It manipulates the data. Most computers have several processors. We call the, the, these several processors as the central processing unit. The, the processor consists of many chips and the circuit board on which they are connected. In either case, the term central processing unit refers to a computer's processor. There are secondary processors available. In the earlier days, there are for calculating math, ma mathematical functions, a math coprocessor was also installed. But nowadays, the math coprocessor is already built in in, this, in, in the microprocessor. And now the uh, core to do is means there are two processors on the same core, and core quad duo means there are four processors on a single core. People often refer to the computer systems by the type of the CPU they contain. A Pentium 4 system, for example, uses a Pentium 4 microprocessor as its CPU. Now let's talk about the other component of the hardware that is memory. Memory is one or more sets of chips that stores data and or programs and instructions. It can store them either temporarily or permanently. Memory is a critical processing component in any computer. There are two important types. One is called random access memory or RAM and the other is the read only memory. Both these memories they work in very different ways and perform distinct functions. Let's talk about the random access memory. This is the most common type. RAM is like an electronic scratch pad inside the computer. RAM holds data and program instructions while the CPU works with them. When a program is launched, it is loaded from the memory and runs from the memory. As the program needs data, it is also loaded into RAM for fast access. As new data is entered into the computer, it is also stored in memory, but only temporarily. 
data is both written to and read from the memory. Because of this, RAM is sometimes called the read-write memory. Like many computer components, RAM is made up of a set of chips mounted on a small circuit board. Like as you see, these are the memory chips which are mounted on a, and we call them a memory chip. RAM is volatile, meaning that it loses its contents when the computer is shut off or if there is a power failure. Therefore, RAM needs a constant supply of power to hold its data. For this reason, you should save your data files to a storage device frequently to avoid losing them in the case of a power failure. RAM has a tremendous impact on the speed and power of a computer. Generally, the more RAM results in a faster system. It can perform certain tasks. The most common measurement unit for describing a computer memory is the byte. Basically, byte is the amount of memory it takes to store a single character. Now let me clarify two distinct terms. One is called bit, B-I-T, bit. Bit comes from binary digit and it is the smallest storage unit inside the computer. Inside the bit, you can store one binary digit. It means either zero or one. Binary means two, it is all the base two. So in the binary system, there are only two digits, zero and one. And byte is the collection of bits. A byte is a collection of eight bit, and it is the smallest addressable unit in the computer. The smallest storage unit is bit, and the smallest addressable unit is byte. When referring to a computer's memory, the numbers are often so large that it is helpful to use terms such as kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and even terabytes. The other type of memory is called ROM. ROM means read-only memory. Unlike RAM, the read-only memory permanently stores the data, so it is non-volatile. Even when the computer power is off, it stores the data and information and the programs. It is called non-volatile because it never loses its content. ROM holds instructions that the computer needs to operate. Whenever the computer's power is turned on, it checks ROM for directions that help it start up and for information about its hardware devices. And this process is called the booting up of the computer. Whenever we boot up the computer, the, the computer circuitry is designed in such a way that it connects to the ROM first of all and checks from there that which hardware devices are attached with the computer and how it should start functioning. The capacity of ROM is typically in kilobytes and in some cases now in megabytes. Now the next component of the system is the input. Input hardware devices are that allow people to put data into the computer in a form that the computer can use. Input devices accept data and instructions from the user or from other computer systems such as computer on the internet. A compu personal computer would be useless if you could not interact it and because the machine could not receive instructions or deliver the results of its work. So input devices accept data from the user or from other computer systems. The most common device is the keyboard which accepts letters, numbers and commands from the user. Another important type of input device is the mouse, which lets you select options from the on-screen menus. You can use a mouse by moving across a flat surface and pressing the 
the buttons most keyboards were designed for the right hand users so it, this is the keyboard for a right hand users you will see the function keys over here the qwerty keyboard these are the numeric pads these are the navigation keys the home insert delete and key the page up page down keys are located here however approximately 10% of the world population is also left handed so some manufacturers they produce keyboards especially for the left hand computer users and this you can see is the left hand keyboard on this keyboard the numeric the navigation keys and the home delete page up page down keys are located on the left side of the keyboard this keyboard is specially designed for the people who work with left hand in the case of mouse it may provide one two or three buttons depending upon the which system software it, it is to be used with but most mouse they use two buttons since this is the minimum number needed for working with the popular microsoft windows operating system there are some other input devices such as the trackball and touchpad they are the variations of the mouse and enable you to draw or point to the screen you can also have the joystick which is a swiveling lever mounted on a stationary base that is well suited for playing video games you can have a scanner that can copy a printed page of text or a graphic into the computer's memory a digital camera can record still images with which you can view and edit on the computer a microphone enables you to input your voice in add or music as data a webcam is a video camera that feeds its images in real time to a computer you can also have the digitizers which means simply capturing an analog signal in digital form and giving it as an input to the computer let's look at some of the output devices output devices return process data to the user or to another computer system most common type of is the of the output device is the monitor the printer and the speaker systems the computer sends output to the monitor which is a display screen when the user needs only to see the output it sends output to the printer when the user requests a paper copy often called a hard copy of the document and for graphs and other thing we can also send in output to a plotter some types of hardware can act as both input and output devices a touch screen for example is a type of monitor that displays text or icons that you can touch when you touch the screen the special sensors they detect they detect the touch and computer calculates the point on the screen where you placed your finger depending on the location of the touch the computer determines what information to display or what action to take next a very common example of the touch screen is the atm machines i hope most of you are familiar with the atm machines you must be holding some bank accounts and you must be withdrawing cash from the atms sound card is another output device it converts audio signals from digital to analog and vice versa for taking input it takes the sound as an analog signal and converts to digital signal for use in the computer and in the case of output to the speakers it converts the digital signals into analog form and transmits to the speakers for output speakers are the devices that play sounds transmitted as electrical signals from the sound card the video cards converts the processor's output information into a video signal that can be sent through a cable to the monitor and monitor is the display device 
that takes the electrical signals from the video card and forms an image using points of colored lights on the screen. Let's talk some of the communication devices. Modem is a device that sends and receives data over telephone lines to and from the computers. Modem stands for modulation and demodulation. The communication devices are most common types of devices that can perform both input and output. And these devices connect one computer to another computer which is a process called networking. The network interface card is an, another networking device which controls the flow of a data on a network link. Now let's talk about the storage devices. The storage devices hold data and programs permanently. To be really useful, a computer also needs a place to keep program files and related data when they are not in use. The purpose of storage is to hold data permanently even when the computer power is turned off. You may think of storage as an electronic file cabinet and RAM as an electronic work table. When you need to work with a program or a set of data, the computer locates it in the file cabinet and puts a copy on the table. After you have finished working with the program or data, you put it back into the file cabinet. The changes you make to the data while working on it replaces the original data in the file cabinet unless you store it at a different place. I hope this analogy will help you understand the concept between RAM and storage devices. No voice computers users, they often confuse storage with the memory. Although the function of storage and memory are similar, they work in different ways. You can see here that the storage, the storage devices, they have more capacity. Nowadays, the storage devices are coming in the, uh, the capacity are in the gigabytes and now the hard disks are coming in terabytes. But the RAM is nowadays available in gigabytes. In most desktop PCs, the common uh, capacity of the memory is 4 gigabytes, 3 gigabytes, 2 gigabytes. In some workstations, they are making it up to 8 gigabytes. The, the contents, the utility of the contents, the contents are retained in storage. It means they are permanent, non-volatile, even when the power is off. But in the case of RAM, once the power is off, all the contents are lost. The storage is much cheaper. The memory is costly. But at the other end, the access speed of the storage devices are slow as compared to the access speed of the RAM. The processor accesses data from the RAM at a very high speed as compared to access data from different storage devices. There are two types of storage devices. One is called magnetic storage and the other is called optical storage. The magnetic storage is the most common type. A disk is a round, flat object that spins around its center. And magnetic disks are almost always housed inside a case of some kind. Then there are read write heads which works on it. The most common the uh, magnetic storage device earlier was found by the floppy disk which stores data on removable 3.5 inch diameter diskette and the typical capacity of a double sided high density was 1.4 megabyte and this floppy disk are now almost obsolete the zip disk stores data on floppy disk cartridges with 70 to 170 times the capacity of the standard floppy the other magnetic storage medium is the hard disk drive. This is a storage device that stores billions of characters of data on a non-removable disk platter. The typical capacities are 40 GB to 750 gigabytes. 
or even more now in terabytes. The hard disk serves as the computer's primary filing cabinet because it can store far more data than a diskit can contain. Diskits are used to load data onto the hard disk, to trade data with other users and to make backup copies of the data on the hard disk. The other type of storage devices, they are called optical storage. The CD-ROM drive is the most common. CD stands for compact disk. It is a storage device that uses laser technology to read data from optical disk. The typical capacity of a uh, CD was either 650 megabyte of data or 74 minutes of audio or 700 megabyte for data or 80 minutes of audio. If you purchase a CDR drive, you have the option of creating your own CDs. A CDR means CD recordable, can write data to and read from a compact disk. To record data with a CDR drive, you must use a special CDR disk, which can be written on only once. And there is another medium which is called CDRW, means CD rewritable, which can be written to multiple times like a floppy disk. And increasing popular data storage technology is the DVD, Digital Video Disk or Digital Versatile Disk, which is revolutionizing home entertainment. Using sophisticated compression technologies, a single DVD, which is the same size in diameter and thickness as the CD drive, but it can contain much more information. The typical size of a DVD is from 4.7 gigabyte to you can find DVDs with the capacity of 17 gigabyte. The future DVD technologies, they promise much higher storage capacities on a single disk. DVD drives can also locate data on the disk much faster than their com the counterpart CD-ROMs. DVDs require a special player and many of the DVD players can play audio, data and free them from the users from purchasing different types of drivers. The latest technology which is coming in the, is the Blu-ray which is the optical disk storage which is designed to supersede the DVD format. The plastics, uh, the size of the in diameter is 120 mm and it is 1.2 mm thick. It is the same physical dimension as we have a standard DVD and CD, but it has more storage capacity. The single layer Blu-ray disc has the capacity of 25 GB. A double layer Blu-ray disc has the capacity of 50 gigabytes. The triple and quad layer are also coming into the market. The triple layer contains 100 GB and the quad layer will have the capacity of 128 gigabytes. The major application of Blu-ray disc is a medium for video materials such as feature films. Besides the hardware specifications, Blu-ray disc is associated with a set of multimedia formats. Generally, these formats allow for the video and audio to be stored with greater definition than on the DVD. The other terminology coming up is the high definition, means storing at a high resolution which gives more clear and distinct picture. Let's talk the, about the measurement of the storage capacity. One byte means one character of data that can be stored. One byte is basically collection of 8 bits. 1 kilobyte, it means 2 raised to power 10 bytes per character. It means 1024 characters. 1 megabyte is 2 raised to power 20 bytes per character. It means 1,048,576 characters. A gigabyte is 2 raised to power 30, more than 1 billion characters and 1 terabyte is more than 1 trillion 
characters. Now let's put all this hardware together and we have the computer system. You can see this is the CPU or the processing and memory communication system unit is inside. We have the storage such as this CD, DVD drive, floppy disk, you have the hard disk over here, monitor, keyboard as the input, mouse as the input, speaker as the output, printer as the output. Processor, memory, hard disk drive, video card, sound card and modems are inside this system cabinet. What is left? Power. So you need a power and it's normally inside the system cabinet. The top cover has been removed to show the internals of a computer power supply unit. Now let's come to the third part of the computer system, which is the software. And software are there to run the machine. It tells the computer what to do. As it is a set of instructions that drive a computer to perform specific tasks and we also call them programs. These instructions, they tell the machine's physical components such as hardware, what to do. And without the instructions, a computer could not do anything at all. When the computer uses a particular program, it is said to be running or executing that program. Although the array of available program is vast and varied, the most software types, they fall into two major categories, namely the system software and application software. The system software are the most important software. They control the computer's hardware. Or they can be used to maintain the computer in some way so that it runs more efficiently. There are three basic types of system software. One is the operating system, which tells the computer how to use its own components. Examples of operating systems include Windows XP, Macintosh operating system, Linux, Unix. An operating system is essential for any computer because it acts as an interpreter between the hardware, application, application programs, and the user. When a program wants the hardware to do something, it communicates through the operating system. Similar, similarly, when the user wants to communicate to the hardware, it must do so through the operating system. The other type of system software is the network operating system which allows computers to communicate and share data across a network while controlling network operations and overseeing the network security. The examples of the network operating systems are Windows Server 2003, Windows Server 2008, Sun operating system, Unix operating system, Linux operating system, Novel Netware operating system. The third category of system software is the utility programs. They make the computer system easier to use or to perform highly specialized functions. Utilities are used to manage disks, troubleshoot hardware problems, and perform other tasks that the operating system itself may not be able to do so. One of the example of utility software is the Northern Utilities software. The other category of the program are the application software. They tell the computer how to accomplish specific tasks such as word processing or drawing for the user. Thousands of application softwares are available for many purposes and for people of all ages from kids up to 90 year or even 100 year old people. Some of the most common types of software are we'll just talk about. 
word processing software for creating text based documents such as newsletters, brochures, theses, assignments and all. Then there are spreadsheets for creating numeric based documents such as budgets or balance sheets. They are mostly used for mathematical calculations and for accounting purposes in the organization. The database management software for building and manipulating data, large sets of data, such as the names, addresses, phone numbers in telephone directory, reservation system for the airlines, for the railways, for the buses, hotel management systems. The presentation programs for creating and presenting electronic slideshows. The graphics programs for creating and presenting electronic slideshows, graphic, pro graphic programs for designing illustrations or manipulating photographs, movies or animation. Multimedia authoring applications for building digital movies that incorporate sound, video, animation and interactive features. Then we have entertainment and education softwares and many of which are interactive multimedia events. Then we have the games, there are a variety of games, archive games, arcade games, mind uh, logic games. You can, most of you are also playing games on the computer at any time. The other category is the web design tools and web browsers and other internet applications such as news readers and email programs. Now let's talk about computer data. In the beginning of the lecture, I have told you that data means raw fact. It has, does not, it has no meaning of its own. When we process data, we convert this data into some useful information for the user. For example, you might think of the letters of alphabets as data, but taken individually, they do not mean a lot. But when they grouped into words and sentences, they make sense. That is, they become information. Similarly, the basic geometrical shapes such as circle, triangles, they may not have much meaning by themselves. But when they are grouped into a blueprint or a chart, they become useful information. A piece of data, be it a letter or an alphabet, has little meaning by itself. When pieces of data, they are combined and placed in some sort of context, such as, as a resume, they become meaningful information. The computer reads and stores data of all kinds, such as words, numbers, images, or sounds in the form of number or digits. Computer only works with numbers, just as people work in the language. The modern digital computers are called the binary computers because they work on the binary language. The binary language consists of only two digits, zero or one. You may ask the question that why computers are developed in the, in the binary language whereas in the normal system we are using the decimal number system which have 10 digits ranging from 0 to 9. It has been seen that making two state device is a lot easier than making a 10 state device. If we have to use the decimal number system for the computers we must make 10 state device. A try was made but it was not so successful and the other reason which you may not believe 
is that calculations they are performed faster in binary than in the decimal. The data in the computers can be organized into files. A file is simply a set of data that has been given a name. A file that the user can open and use is often called a Although many people think of documents simply as text, a computer document can include many kinds of data. For example, a computer document can be a text file such as a letter or a group of numbers such as the budget, a video clip which includes images and sounds or any combination of these items. Programs are also organized in the files as well and these files contain the instructions and data that a program needs in order to run and perform tasks. Let's discuss the computer users. Personal computers which are the focus of this course, they are designed to work with a human user. In fact, the user is a very critical part of a complete computer system, especially when a personal computer is involved. This may seem surprising since we tend to think of computers as intelligent devices, capable of performing amazing tasks. People also sometimes believe that computers can think and make decisions just like humans do. But this is not the case. Even the most powerful supercomputers requires human interactions. If for no other reason than to get them started and tell them which problem to solve. So human interaction is very important in the computer system. The user's role in the computer system, it depends on the ability. The user can take several roles depending on what he or she wants to accomplish. Like the role of setting up the computer. Have you ever bought a new PC when you got it home you probably had to unpack it set it up and make sure it worked as expected if you want to change something about the system a process called configuration you will likely do it yourself whether you want to add a new hardware you want to change the way program look on the screen and you want to customize the way a program function the other role is installing the software. Although your new computer probably come with a operating system and some application programs, you need to install any other programs you want to use for your personal use. And this may involve loading software from a disk or you may download, download it from a website. Either way, it is usually the user's responsibility to install the programs unless the computer is used at school or business in that case a system administrator or technician may be available to do the installation job the third role is running the program whenever your computer is on there are several programs running in the background such as the software that runs your mouse and printer some antivirus software, some dictionaries. Such programs do not need any user input. In fact, you may not even be aware of them. But for the most part, if you want to use your computer to perform a task, you need to launch and run the software to do the job. This means installing the program, learning its tools, and working with it to make sure it gives you the results you want. 
the next role is managing files as we have discussed that a computer saves data in files if you write a letter to a friend you can save it as a file making it available to open and use again later on pictures songs and other kinds of data are stored as files but it is the user's job to manage these files and store them in different directories for easy accessible it also means when to delete the data when it is no more required you may have to copy from one location to another or you have to copy them to another disk for safekeeping the other use the role of the human is the maintaining the system some min system maintenance does not necessarily means opening the pc and fixing the broken parts as you would repair the car engine but in pc maintenance however generally means running utilities that keeps the disk free of clutter and ensure that the computer is making the best use of its resources in the beginning i also talked about the userless computer let's have a, a little bit of discussion of the userless computers userless computer means that they run with no user input for example if uh, you own a car that have been programmed installed and started it almost certainly has an onboard computer that controls and monitors the engine functions many new home appliances such as washers and dryers they have the built-in computers that monitors the water usage drying timings balance and other operations sophisticated userless computers operate the security systems navigation systems communication systems and many others but these userless computers they are typically controlled by their own operating system in these devices the operating system may be installed on special memory chips rather than a disk the operating system is programmed to perform a specific set of tasks such as monitoring a function or checking for a failure and a little else these systems are not set up for human interaction except as needed for system con configuration and maintenance so these userless computers are few most of the computer systems they require user to intervene and interact with the system for the smooth uh, performance of the system let's come to the summary of the today's lecture i hope you have got a clear concept in the beginning we discuss about the different parts of the computer system a complete computer system includes hardware software data and people hardware consists of electronic devices the parts you can touch the software are the programs consisting of instructions that that control the computer and solve your problems the data can be text numbers sounds images that the computer manipulates the people or the users who operates the com computer systems then we discuss about information processing cycle to manipulate data the computer follows a process called the information processing cycle which includes the data input processing output and storage 
the com a computer's hardware devices they fall into four categories namely the processor memory input devices output devices storage devices the processing function is divided between the processor and the memory the processor carries out the instructions from the users and software random access memory holds data and program instructions as the cpu works with them the read only memory or rom is another important type of memory which holds instructions that helps the computer start up and information about its hardware in input devices is to accept instructions and data from the user or another computer the output devices they process data to the user and to another computer the communication devices they perform both input and output functions allowing computers to share information the storage devices hold data and programs permanently even when the computer is turned off there are two primary storage uh, mediums the magnetic storage medium and the optical storage medium then we talk about the computer software there are two primary categories of computer software one is the system software another is the application software the system software tells the computer how to interact with the user and how to use the hardware devices attached to the computer the application software tells the computer how to accomplish tasks the user requires in a computer data consists of small pieces of inf information that by themselves may not make sense to a person the computer manipulates data to make useful information and program instructions are different from data in that they are used only by the computer and not by the people then we discuss about the computer users a user is an essential part of a com uh, personal computer system generally the user must perform a wide range of tasks such as setting up the system installing the software managing files and other operations that the system cannot do by itself and we also discuss about some userless computers which are designed to function independently without a user but these systems are not personal computers i hope that today's lecture is clear to you inshallah we will see you in the next lecture allah hafiz